So here we are. We have the DAW. Oh, I, we had to make one change, just so you folks know, just in case you didn't see. Um, I think the seventh sentence was, did you tell a story about your hunting? But we're just going to say hunting, because I think that would be a lot easier. We changed it before I gave it to the students. Oh, OK. You can. OK. So the first one. The dog is heading <laughs> towards your home. Anybody want to share what you came up with? Uh, you may stay on the first way, Kate. Anybody else? Okay, anything different? Okay. Uh, so again, we'll talk about this naqqi. Do we talk about naqqi in here in sentences? What's naqqi? Octopus tentacles? Yes, octopus tentacles. So in Hawaiian, they, they say he'e for, it's really cool because in Hawaiian, they've got, in the Hawaiian language, they have a different word for an octopus, a squid. But from what I understand, when they speak English, they call them both squid, but you also know which one they're talking about if you hang out with them a whole lot, which I don't understand how that works. But they use it to talk about their grammar, to say like, here's these, and I really like this analogy, so we, I use it when I talk about shinget. It's like, these, this is a thing, and this is a thing, and you can move them around. So shinget, you can move things around, but you can't move everything around. They have to be in these pieces, so they're, they're each octopus tentacle. So you are going to probably end up in this sentence with the dog, your home, it is going towards, or he or she or they is going towards, is what you're going to end up with. And those three things can move around. And so when I show you what, how I wrote it, this is not a right or wrong type of thing. There are variations. For example, you could say ihiti, or you could say inneishi, and they're both just fine. So what I have is ihiti de yanagutwe cake. Any questions, thoughts? Uh, to, to avoid uh, like uh, the because I wrote in each day um, to, to avoid like the e and the i mixing to become like the long e a sound uh, I, I put a little glottal stop there is that, that how you do it so if you say nech that's a home and if you say i nech it has to go to inneshi inneshi so then you have inneshi day Okay, the next yeah. day. So, I, so nesh is low, the i is going to be high, so then the day is going to be low. Sheesh. Oh. Right, so. Also flip, so it's always a. Day is always the opposite of whatever's before it. And I, that suffix I, is also the opposite of whatever's before it. Right. So it's like a trigger effect. So the suffixes come in a specific order. In day. And you'll see here, it hit the day. So that's how that's how it works. So then you'll have, but I think that's the end. You can, you can only have. You can have I think one other suffix and a noun, but it has to be plural or small. So I could say it hit the day, but that doesn't have a vowel, so it doesn't affect it. It hit the day. You're in a good way, Kate. The dog is going towards your houses because you're jitty dana. So does the possession uh, suffix always come before the direction suffix? Yes. So it goes. I think so. If we have three spots there, spot number one, it could be a an x apostrophe or a k apostrophe, but you can't have both. It could be one or the other, small or plural. Second spot is the relational suffix so it's to mark possession third one 
is a directional. Okay, anything else? Other questions, thoughts? My paternal uncle is driving to Anchorage. Anchorage Aksani At Wukuk. Jeez. Anchorage de Yanakuk Aksani. Any other variations? You know, when you make a little click with your mouth in English, that means you want to talk. Just to, and I'm not saying you have to. I was just saying, I learned that by hanging out with linguists. They, they're, like, they're like, that means you want to say something. I was like, just take it easy, Pat. Mine is the same as Anders. I just put the subject in a different spot. Anchorage day, ya achsani nakuch. Oh, okay. I thought that might have been wrong. Yeah, so the ya nakuch, that's, those are a single tentacle. So that's, and so once, as we learn more about how the verb works, we'll see, like, because, yeah. And so you could, so I put achsani anchorage day, ya nakuch. Now, which one, so there's three things, what are the three things in there? It's, it's a three tentacle sentence. There's uh, there's the objects. There's uh, don't name them. Just tell me what to say. Uh, the things. Achsani, Enkuche, Yanaka. Well, you said the which one? Those are three things. Did you pause? Is that what you did? Yeah. Okay. Maybe more of a pause because <laughs> <laughs> kind of just read the same. <laughs> right, so the first thing is. Achsani. Uh, Achsani. Yeah. <laughs> The second thing is <laughs> and the third thing is Yanakuch. So those three things, they cannot you can't separate those things. Because ach yan sani kuch. It starts to go starts to get really bonkers. But you can move those three things around. So ankech de you can say ankech de yanakuch ach sani. Ankech de ach sani yanakuch. Yanakuch ankech de ach sani. You could do any one of those combinations. Some of them sound a little forced. Which one would you say first and why? Well, the reason why I put first is because uh, I, I'd assume that the context of the conversation is somebody being like, Gusuwe uh, Isani you know. Uh, like, uh, where, where, where's your uh, uncle driving to? So I, I would put the thing that's most important first. Yeah, so context is everything. What you put first is the most important thing, right? So that's like the most important piece of information. So if we all know about this dog who causes a big ruckus and like kills guinea pigs or cats or does something terrible, then I would say, wait, Kate. Or or <laughs> it could happen. Um, and so, but if it's sort of like, and then, so some of this stuff, this is a sentence in isolation. So if someone's asking you a question, then that determines how you answer it. So if they said, Adusa Anchorage de Yanakuch, Achsani Anchorage de Yanakuch. Right? And so generally the part with the day or the dach with the directional thing is usually going to come right before the motion verb. Like you kind of really need to know why you would separate them if you if you did. But you could. But that's where it's you're like yanakuch achsani ankech day. It sounds like Sounds like you um, are a little scattered on the parts, but it still works. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? I think the next one is not easy. The eagle flew back to its nest. Uh, 
כן, צריך And it's something kind of weird. I don't know if it works. Kut kuch de udekin wej ak. Any other variations? Uh, I have ak kud kuch udekin. We have wechak dukudit kuchudkin. So clicking your tongue is knowing you want to speak is unmuting on Zoom, so the linguistic equivalent. Yes, I think so. I think so, yes. So, yes, it's cheese. Okay, this I'll see what I came up with. I might want to change after. You just have some good ideas. Anyone else want to share? Kuch with the kin we chalk the kudit. I like it. I like that. I'll keep it. Uh, yes. Is kudit like nest? Yes. Kudit is nest. Uh. There are different ways I think you could say, and this is one where we're getting into a territory where there's probably different ways you could say it. So because the English sort of implies that it already happened, Klingit would need to know two very, like, Klingit would know, need to know this. Did it turn around and fly back towards its nest and that's all we know? Or did it arrive at its nest? Like it, Klingit kind of signals that, right? So English doesn't necessarily, like you would use a different verb, I think. Because you would say, for example, if the other night it was pretty sketchy driving conditions. And so you might say they went home, but then you would say they made it home, right? So that's how you would, mm -hmm. you would make that distinction, right? So if someone says, I'm kind of worried about them driving, oh, they made it home, right? So that's, you would switch verbs to made it. So in Klingit, the way that this would work is, uh, let's see how it works. So you would have two options. I want to make this bigger. Uh, oops. Big children, okay. So you would have, um, Let's say, let's just say nil. We'll just use nil generally. So you could say nil de wukur. We'll just say somebody driving, right? And so that, and then you could say nil wukur. What are these two? Say. Is it that they drove towards home and versus they arrived at home? Yes. Right. And so think it that it's a pretty big distinction, and it's also why you hear something. You'll hear someone say "yigut" and "iyagut," or "wugut" and "uwagut." And so it does affect it. So you see it, it, it affects the stem. So this one is long and low. This one's short and high. And it affects the prefix. This one is woo. This one is uwa. But those are both perfective forms of the verb to like, they went by boat or car. And so you could do, if, if they're walking, How would we do these two if they were walking? What do you think? Uh, the bottom one would be uagut, uh, <clears throat> and the top one would be uagut. Close. Uagut. Uagut. Why? Why? Because <laughs> <laughs> it. Uh, I, don't know. I think that's different in English too. Departures, arrivals. I guess so. I just because mm -hmm. it's the same. Verb, mm -hmm. root, 
it has the same like object and subject and it has the same classifier, why is it two different ways? So this this only does this for the third person and for the second person singular. For the rest, you would change only the stem. And this is these are just things I think it's just got a few things that are just uh, they're just neat little they're just neat little puzzles. So for example, if I'm talking about you, right? So here's these two done. So if those that's gonna be the same, that's gonna be the same. What do you think it might be if I'm saying you did it? And we might not have done anything like this before. This first one is ye. You singular. And then And so here, what do you think we're going to end up with? Be good. And? Be good. Be good. So you do have to just kind of remember these and what you have here. These ones on the bottom are a zero conjugation verb. This one up here would be everything else. Na, ka, and ka. And so even like motion verbs are kind of wild because a motion verb says I can take on any conjugation prefix I want to. I could, I could switch types, and it's determined by the type of motion. Day will always be na conjugation. The letter T will always be zero con Well, in this case, will be zero conjugation. Is there like an explanation of why? Because there's no N, like not in that verb, but why is it? So what we're going to learn is learning to put verb modes together. We have to know the conjugation type because that's going to tell us, most often it tells us what the stem is going to do, right? And so we'll see, we'll see this pattern. A, a perfective, a closed perfective. So when we say closed, that means there's a consonant in the end. So kuch is closed, gut is closed. A zero closed in the perfective will be short and high. Everything else will be long and low. But we don't need to remember that right now. We just need to do the next sentence. Look at this. Whoops. So, kuch with the king. The kuch part is where we get the return to go back. Uh, and then there's different ways. So, like you could say, and so dukudi uh, would look like this. Whoops, dukudi. Mm -hmm. And you could say dukudi day, and you could say dukudi. It might be just like that. I think it's gonna get pushed long. Dukudi. And that means it went back and it made it to its nest. But you could say kuch with the kin, which ark, the kudi day. You could say that too. Thoughts or questions? Oh, I think I did this next one well. Y'all, you're going to defeat me in this next one, I think, if I remember what I did. The deer was walking along the beach.
Where Guwakan Nichk Wugut. Jeez. Any others? I think I did Yana good for this. But let's see. Maybe I did. I did. Oh, okay, why wouldn't it be? Because I modeled this after an Akbahasha sentence. The raven yes. was walking along the beach. Because you technically, okay. This is a big okay. There's a big storytelling thing going on right here. So when you start a story, if you really study, like, if you take a look at Tlingit stories and you look at what the verbs are doing, what usually happens is the perfective verbs, especially a big story like Raven did this, did that, this happened, that happened. But then I'll switch to some sort of what would be in English called a present tense verb to signal a scene shift. So that's why they usually start as which is technically Raven is walking on the beach. But Tlinga is very fluid with time, which is why I did this one this way. I'm just kidding. I just did it wrong. So I would say Wugut. So you wouldn't need a uh, A in front of that X, you would just slap the X right onto Nietzsche? Yes. And so the the beach on for Tlingit is also just kind of an interesting thing because Nietzsche is just going along and what it's telling you is it's following the ocean. And that's why it usually it just gets treated a little bit differently than some of the others. Like you could say to walk along a mountain, then you would use kanach uh, or something like that. Uh, so nich wugut we guwakan. And again, guwakan could come first. So we kind of have our, I would say, okay, how many tentacles do you think are here? Kun nap eri sat Hmm? Yeah, okay, so if we look at this one, Ihiti Day, you can't separate those things. Yanagut, you can't really separate those things. Wekek. So those are three different things, but you can now move them around. You could say Wekek Yanagut Ihiti Day. You could say Yanagut Wekek Ihiti Day. It sounds a little funky. Um, Yanagut seems like it fits really well right in the middle. But you could say, Ihiti de wekech Yanagut. Like, all, it still makes sense. But you can move them around. And so there's three here. There's three in Achsani, Ankech de, Yanakuch. Did we count them here? Yes. So the Kuch. There's three. So the kuch couldn't be. I don't think you could say kuch which ak the kuti to the king. I think kuch wants to be right before the motion verb. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Part the, the place where putting all the words, fourth row says kune kakani. Is that is that where put the stuff that you can talk with? Yes, Khane's translation. Is it Dech? Yes. So there are Dech Nab Kleri here, because Nietzsche will go to Nietzsche will go to Khan will go. I wouldn't want to separate those two, but we go to Khan will go to Nietzsche. Maybe. That's literally the sentence first. Yeah, so this one, but this one is interesting because there's so many raven stories that start 
with this exact line. Like as, as soon as someone says that, you know they are going to tell you a raven story. A whole bunch of them start like that. Yeah, raven was walking on the beach. See something, hear something, does something. And they chose Kulakan because of Gage Kulakan. Oh, okay. Okay. Because I love hearing her to get to tell that. She was so funny. I have little stories for all the sentences I come up with, y'all. Yeah. Nora. So, Keuchne and Nora Dauenhauer was just um, an amazing person. If you have two hours to spare, on YouTube you could find a movie. Uh, I made a documentary called... A kach kushagau. Is that what it's called? Language warriors. And so the story behind it is a little heartbreaking. So those those are my longtime teachers. They were my heroes. They were poets. They were translators. They were teachers. They documented Klingit and they were just fun to be around. Like they were just they were really good at laughing and Richard was really good at just theorizing about how everything worked, and you could just bounce ideas off of him. And Nora had high expectations. So when you spoke Klinget with her, especially if you knew her, like she, she just expected a lot out of you, you know? And so there was sometimes you'd be a little bit of a shame that you didn't know what she was saying or didn't know how to say the thing, but she was also incredibly kind and fun. And uh, I got a grant from the Alaska Humanities Forum and then another one from the Rasmussen Foundation to make a movie about them. So I bought, bought a bunch of gear. Kathy Ruddy was instrumental in helping to set up these sessions. But there was this huge like delay, like some grant agency had someone who got a new job. And anyways, this big delay. And so finally, like six months later, we're ready to go. So I wrote, I wrote Richard an email. I said, let's, let's do this thing. And I asked them beforehand, too. I said, you guys have always been on the other side of the recorder. Like, who's going to tell your story? Who's going to know about what you guys did? Can I make a movie about you guys? And they said, yes. And so um, before that, I was I would go over to their house regularly and I would I would call them. They were so fun because like I think Richard just stayed in his office upstairs and I think Nora just sat downstairs because when I called them, they would always both answer the phone. They would have this little like three way phone call. It was always because mm. I always had language questions, you know, and they would bounce ideas around. And uh, anyways, I went over there. Well, I talked to Richard. I said. Do you think Nora would let me record her speaking Klinge? Because I was getting into documenting elders. And he said, well, she always says no. But let's have bagels and smoked salmon in the tea room. And we'll have tea. And then you just ask her. Because she might do it for you. So that was our strategy. We had wonderful lunch. And then uh, I started setting up my camera. And she said, what are we doing? <laughs> and I said, well, I was hoping I could film you speaking Klinge. And she goes, I better comb my hair. <laughs> so she, she leaves. And she comes back. And she says, what do you want me to say? I said, I don't know. I said, you, you're always, you've made hundreds of recordings of people. What do you want to say? What do you want your grandchildren to know? And she said, well, I always heard this told a little bit differently than I hear it being told today. And so I said, well, would you do that? And so she did. And we made this neat little recording. And then afterwards, I was putting my gear away. And she said, this anthropologist used to always try and get me to tell him Raven stories. And I married him, but I wouldn't tell him Raven stories. <laughs> <laughs> we just had so much fun but and so i know we're getting sidetracked but this is important information and so they had done they had made this mountain of work like we, we could spend our whole lives going through their recordings going through the texts going through the beginning and what 
what started as intermediate Tlinget and became Hausanei Chayu Chatamudi. But they said, you know, so I wrote, I wrote Richard this email. I was like, finally, this grant thing, blah, blah. When's a good time to film? And he says, well, I've been working on this letter. I've been trying to figure out how to send it to people. So I guess you'll take a look at it. And it says he was diagnosed with cancer. He had a very short window that he would be alive. So I said, well, we don't have to do it. I said, if it's, if it's too much, like I don't, I don't want to give you more stuff, but maybe it'll be fun to do. Maybe it'll just take your mind off of this huge thing, you know, this huge loss. And so he, he said, I'll think about it. And then he said, okay. So we set up this recording session. It's he and Nora, there are times where she was really emotional. She also had pretty serious onset dementia at that point. Uh, but we just had this wonderful conversation that lasted about two, maybe two hours. And it was at times very sad. It was at times like funny. Like sometimes I was like, we didn't know how to start. And I just said, well, how'd you guys get into it? How'd you get started? And then it got into this really sort of sad time. And then I just said, talk about funny things that happened while you're doing this work. And they had some great stories. And then he died. Like we had one recording session and he was gone. And so then I just kept going over and visiting with Nora every Friday. And we, I would film her telling about just all kinds of stuff that was on her mind. And sometimes she wasn't in great health, so we'd just have tea, you know. And so if you have time, check it out. Because it's, you should hear their story. You should hear their words. There's times where Nora's just like on fire in that video. And so, um, but I think about that because the Raven book was their last big project. And I don't know when it'll get done or if it'll get done. Um, but Nietzsche in a good date is something I think about a lot when I think about their work. And Dukoche Yenate, that was their first text that they made. Anyways, sorry. Thoughts or questions? You gotta know who they are, the downhouse. Okay. I also gotta fix all my deer sentences. Why are the children standing behind the boat? <clears throat> I think I accidentally did why are the children standing around the boat okay. or about the boat. And I also forgot the directional for behind, but I should remember that one. Uh, okay. This, okay, this one, there's, there's some parts in here. And like you can ask any time about stuff that you've been wondering. Uh, like we can look at the sheet. I can, I'll be looking at the sheet between classes and stuff. I saw some of the questions that were on there. Um, and you can ask here as well. Uh, but the way I would write this one is Why is Yak and Tate split apart? Well, uh, disclosure, Kune did not go over this um, suffix with you all. Oh, the, the Tate? Yeah, it's just in the reference book. I accidentally wrote a sentence that we didn't cover. <laughs> what, like, would Zook work too? Zook. Zook. I think you would need a back. I think that would be behind like a living thing because I think it oh. means like a, a back. But okay, so why is Yak and Tate separate? Is that what he said? Separate? Yeah. I have them squished together. Oh, or I have Yak Tate. Yeah. Okay, so Tate, T 
A means behind something, and it's one of these words I, I call a relational base, which means it's its own word and it can take a suffix, but it needs to belong to something. It's also called a relational noun. So we write it with the long dash, which I guess is confusing. <laughs> Kind of I also had that attached. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then uh, take means to. It's interesting because as a verb root, I think it's related. It means to come upon something or to find something. And then there's this ka yet nach, which would mean behind the behind along the faces of the people. Shall I just show you the next thing? Oh, whoops. Why did that happen? Look at this point. Huh? Look at this point. This, this should be easy. <laughs> but, oh, what, what just happened? Bonkers. OK, hold on. Hold on. It's a whole other jetpack. OK. So, um, Oh, so would literally mean behind the faces of people going along, and it means in secret. Any other? So is the verb for they all are standing. And then, oh, here's, OK, so if we have this sentence, which is complicated. This is a complicated sentence, right? What if I wanted to say, why is that child standing behind the boat. What would need to change? The verb would change from plural to singular. What would it become? Uh, it's like uh, hun. Hun. this hun. So now this goes to hun. And then what else? There's one more change. Uh, a dot k would have to be just a dot. Did we do this one? Uh, it's a, I think we did uh, this. Uh, yes. Oh. yes. Oh. We did do that. A child. You know, one time I taught four college courses in the same semester, which is a lot, if you ask me. And three of them were the same subject twice on one, twice, twice on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and once on Tuesday, Thursday. And so the Monday, Wednesday, Friday ones went for an hour. Tuesday, Thursday went for an hour and a half. So I was teaching the same subject, intro to academic writing. Three, there's three different sections that were all full. It was at UAF. And I said, OK, this semester you're going to hear me say a whole bunch of times. Did we talk about this already? <laughs> <laughs> I did it to you all, too. OK. One nach sowe yak teit has nak we adat ki. One nach sowe yak teit han we adat how many pieces? One you can't pull those apart. Yak eight, it has to go in that order. Hasnak, that's the single verb. The hus is part of that verb. And we adatki. Those are your four things. Since this is a question, it does not make sense to have one nachsawi anywhere but at the front. Yak, I guess you could say yak eight has nachwe adaki, one nachsawi. But that's technically, I think, your two different sentences. You had a few students who thought yes. Do you want to talk about the difference between the two? Yes, okay. So if So that is a grammatically correct sentence. 
right? So one echs away is a straight up why. One echs away irach. Why are you crying? One echs away ach yicha. Why did you eat my food? Now I'm crying, right? And so one uh, echs is just straight up just why, right? Dot yes. Well, you didn't have sa. Sorry. So the yes part would be to benefit what, right? So it kind of it might not make a whole lot of logical sense to say this unless the children, like I don't, I, I don't even know. So like when you say dot yes, I would usually use that for like. Who are you cooking this for? Who are you making this for to give? Like it's going to be given to someone. It's going to benefit somebody. And that's really what yis is kind of usually doing. Like you say, iji yis, this is for you to have. Right? So it usually is linked with things that are going to be given. So I don't, I guess if we're giving these kids away, so you know, like, we don't want to do that. But the yes, that's what that's usually doing. Sheesh. Oh, that's five, and we're at half time. So let's take five minutes, and we'll come back, do the other cage in. Sheesh. I always have some extra words that you don't have. Actually, I have less words than you have. Sheesh, Yuhan. Uh, I'll put the link to this in the chat, but this is a speech that Peuchne made to a group of us talking about the Raven book. Uh, yeah, we'll just listen to it. And I, I just really, Teen Kathy Reddy uh, was an amazing human being. So she drove Nora there from the funeral, uh, if I remember right. And then we were kind of nervous because we didn't know how to start this meeting, talking about how to do this work, because Richard Dauenhauer was a, an incredible coordinator of projects. Like, he needed Nora because she knew the language. But he was very good at organizing and just getting stuff done. Like, these are such monumental projects to translate gigantic speeches. So Nora and Richard translated, did the first like line-by-line -line translation ever of Klinget. And it was the speech by Natla and Jesse Dalton, which was recorded by Kahani Rosita Worrell at a Kuif, at a Kuif mm -hmm. in Hunan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to people who were there, and Nora was very scared to do that work because Jesse Dalton was still alive. And then the very first line by line translation of a story they did was by Yesh Nawu Tom Peters, and they recorded it in Teslin. Uh, it was very fun. So like when I asked them about, to just share like funny things, this was one that, that Dick shared. He said, uh, they, went, they went to record Tom Peters in Teslin. And on the way, they recorded Bert Dennis, who was my great grandpa in Skagway, and my great grandma, Marion Dennis, who recorded those two. The Klinget names were Ankadachzin and Kashtulich. And they recorded Tom Peters. They left. They worked on the recording for like a year, writing down the Klinget, translating it into English. So they went back a year later and they said, Well, we wrote this down. We want to read it to you to see if we wrote it accurately. And so Richard Dauenhauer read it to him. And he got done, and Tom Peters, Yishnau, was very excited. And he said, I didn't know you could speak Klinget like that. <laughs> and Richard said, this, this that was you, it was your words. And he said, well, that's a great story. Let me tell you how it ends. You know, and so, because he, I think, had sung the two songs, there's two songs that go with that story. And then maybe just got distracted or excited and just kind of stopped. And so... I was teaching Klinget in Teslin, found those two recordings, 
and splice them together into one recording. So we also have those, which we can look at later in the semester. But we're getting together and talking about how we're possibly going to finish this Raven book. We're all nervous, I think. And then Nora just gave us this incredible speech. And Kathy Reddy very quickly grabbed her phone, hit record on the voice memo, and now we have it. And you hear a baby making some noise, which in Yesh Nawu's second, the, the second recording where he finishes the story, there was a baby there. And he's like, quiet, baby. He's trying to keep the baby quiet because he's crying. And when we were listening in Tessin, they told me who the baby was. But there's a different baby on this one. Oh, wait, I got to share my sound. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Hat <laughs> 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 Has to in Cockanainik. Ya, I think it you got hunga ya archia, cocka, you got hunga osikua. Has to Hanaki could get a swasa or to you, as can I was. Has to in Canainik was a coin go. Sometimes, so I could do it, you know, it's mm. kind of hard to do. I work with a shoe sometimes, Jacques. Then you do the next thing with your cotton getting. A joy in Kahanik, in Kahanik has to Hanhnayat Kahisa Kuku Dahasa sing it, Yukatanga Siku as to Jida Yukai, the Tanki Shakta, a corporation to Nah Kahisa Ku. Catch <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she had uh, big words. She always had big words. And she was 
just a powerful, powerful human being. Just all the things that she did. One time she wrote a poem in Tlingit about uh, a bear who came and ate all of our eggs and our orange juice. We were at a camp and um, they would come around a lot at night, but they kind of left us alone. So that was up. And, uh, thoughts or questions, reflections? Um, what, what, what he, what, 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 what you, what you was uh, saying, uh, I, I feel about it rather than just saying to wooch, he said to wooch. Uh, why is that? So when you say to wooch, it's a really interesting thing. Um, when I first started noticing this, I was working with George and Marge, and I was having them translate stuff. And it, it, we, we did both listening to old recordings of big raven stories and translating them. And we also had smaller things that were both like the Kuhanti book and the others that were translating from English to Thlingit. And sometimes it was just like, look at these pictures. And so when one of them was unsure, they would offer a translation. Like Marge did this, and, and well, I think they both did. But like, so for example, Marge would say something, and she'd look at George and say, Wasa'i tu wuch, which is, how do you feel about it? Really, is, is how you end up. To, and so, Wasa'i tu wuch is sort of like, how are you, how are you feeling? And it's really interesting because I don't even know how to. It seems like an incomplete thing, because that ch is on there, which usually marks the thing that does the verb or the thing that you do the verb with. And so, but it works really well just to turn something towards someone and say, what do you think about that? And you know, the inside scoop is, dementia was, was really getting the better of her at, at, shortly after that. And I was working with her to translate her own words. And she got really mad at some point, and she said, I don't know what she's saying. And I said, oh, it's you. She said, then she laughed and she said, I don't know why I said that, and I don't know what I'm saying. You know? But we worked through it, and it was great, and it was, it was also a high-pressure situation, because these are her own words. And there were a number of times where she said, it's your turn. I did this work. You tell me what it says. <laughs> it beads of sweat, you know. So. No pressure there. Yeah, right. Just like here, let me tell you what you said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, in front of the the master translator. So, okay, we are singing later. What'd you come up? The yagen ke at Any other variations? Segan ke atku gashi. I put Zia. <laughs> Just to see if you'd catch it. <laughs> all learning here <laughs> because even though it's we are singing later it's we will be singing yes yeah so you end up with we the english technically would be we will be singing later yes why do you have to have the at to she and not just to she? So if i take the at out of there what does that say now Later will be singing, or we will sing it later. So now there's a specific song. So different verbs take care of this in different ways. Eating and singing both do it this way, right? And same with reading. Well, no, reading's different. So if you say uh, that means we're going to eat it. Right. That means there's something. But we just say, we're going to eat. And so technically, you're, we will sing something later. Okay, that makes sense. 
I don't think that's what you think. <clears throat> yeah, so what is Ziyakin and Ziyak? <laughs> See if you pass my little test that I put. In. <laughs> Ziyak is a little while ago, and Ziyagin is a little while from now. Yeah, what? A little while ago, we are going to sing. I don't make any sense. Sing it. So how would you say we sang yesterday? Ooh, okay. Let's put it right here. <laughs> well, okay. Well, if we want to say yesterday, we can, but we can also use Ziyak. We sang a little while ago. But that could also be Tatke. That's no problem. Go back to the beginning. Go back. Yeah. Beginning can go as you sit on Tatke. Oh, okay. Like, I gotcha. Like 25 sentences. I thought you were telling me to like, go back to the beginning of the slideshow uh, or something. I wouldn't like that. Uh, what is to be at? at? Okay. But I feel confident. <laughs> We haven't done much of this, so it's okay. Come on. Even if you took a wild guess. Would to shit. Would to? Oh, sure. Okay. The panel will accept would to. She blank. We'll go blank and then she. Oh. Oh, she? Oh, uh, so. She. Haven't heard it yet. That's close, but I need a different vowel. Yeah. I need a different vowel. Two was she. Yak at what two was she. We sang a little while ago. I thought in the perspective that it was oh. almost always plus I. That is plus I. So, um, so you have a perf you have a perfective marker which turns to wu. You have tu, which is us, and you have ya, which is the perf that's the plus i of the zero classifier. Mm -hmm. But we we put it with the little chewaki y, the y with the eyes on it, because if a u vowel comes before it, transform it to a w. Which is exactly what happens here. And what if I took that out? Ziyakwatu was she. Then you need to say what you sang. Yes, we sang it earlier. <clears throat> Which it? Well, so it could be tortured poets department. But well, if you take the ut out, then you have to like put the name of the song, don't you? Well, you it, like unless it's implied. Or is it implied? Yeah, like so. Oh. Someone's like, "Hey, let's sing the whatever. Let's sing, um, you know, let's sing that shukach at this song. Ziyakatuish. We're singing it earlier." Oh yeah, <laughs> what is that? Hokey pokey, hokey pokey got to she. Tight, Ziyaka, Ziyaka to wish. Okay. So, about the we are singing later versus we will sing later, one's passive voice in English and one's active voice, but they're both correct. And I try to write the sentences in active voice. Okay. To train myself out of being a researcher. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Think it, is all passive. it would just be future, right? It would just. If you want to do like, let's sing later, that's getting into different tips. It was fun. It was like a, a catch. Was yeah. Like, and so I would get tripped up as a learner myself with the future being we will versus we are. But in English, it's the same. It's just your voice. And think, or in think it's the same. In English, it just differs on whether you're active voice or passive voice. So you so, say we are going to rock you. Mm -hmm, versus we will rock you. They're both silly, but we I thought it would be a nice little going. twist for you all in there to think and take it to a tundi versus trying to be like, well, is there a word for R versus a word mm. for will? Yeah, Shlingit does not need 
they call those? Is, are, was? The linking verbs? Oh, yeah. The positions? Um, we don't need those is's is and was's. Is. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Junction. Back to the translation. Did you? I, I believe. I believe according to Schoolhouse Rock, those are conjunction functions. Conjunction is and, but, or. Yeah. Not. Although. Not. <laughs> Did you tell a story? about hunting. As a head, uh, Okay. Any other Okay. Uh, again. Any others? I think I wrote down. <laughs> Let's see what I put down. A tune dot get Kaitlinik. So, backing up a little bit, the Yagen. Ech cannot move anything out of ke at gach tu shi. That's the whole verb. Achun dot ke skaitlini. Rather than, uh, uh, rather than uh, as uh, as uh, you you just did about the verb for hunting. You could say as eat dot get skaitlini. Oh, but you'd have to add as as eat is another way to say hunting. Probably more common in the interior than on the coast. Uh, it literally means to go beneath the forest floor. Don't know why. That's how it works. Uh, the ge I would put it here. But then I guess what you're sort of saying is is it a story about hunting that you told? That's kind of I think how the it would literally translate. So this ge comes right after what you were asking. So you could make the argument that it could come after skaitlenik, but it depends. If I knew somebody told a story about hunting, and I'm asking if you're the one who did that, I would probably say skaitlenik ge da. Was it you who told the story about hunting? But if I knew you told the story, and I was curious if it was about hunting, so it's, it's interesting. There's like a little bit of logical sort of puzzling that goes on there. Thoughts or questions? Did you ever put ge? Between alun and dat, alun, I wouldn't. Okay. So a relational noun should not really. Mm. I, I wouldn't separate it from the noun. 
right? So for example, um, well, okay. Yak get, no, I, yak get eight. I, I don't think you can do it. Because um, if you're saying, is that a boat that the children are, I, I, you would have to go yak get eight. You would have to throw a uh in there. It'd have to become its own thing. Name the thing. It's it's behind. Um, yeah. So you, you would have to reproduce. You would have to switch it to the a. Uh. A tune. A a tune get a dot. Sky clinic. You could do that. That would be fine. But you would have to throw a uh in there. You would need a placeholder. Good question. Would it make sense to do like I tried to do and put the asun after the skydlinik and so skydlinik asuni? Would that be understood? Skydlinik asun. Oh. So skydlinik asuni. You told a story. It sounds. It feels like there's a comma there, and you're calling someone a hunter. I don't, I don't know. So the the dot part for telling stories. Well, there's a couple of things going on here. Uh, so if this is another one where I could say. I could say it that way. But now it's a little bit vague because this is another example of you told the story of it, you told a story or told stories. So then this would be some specific hunting trip that I'm thinking of. And so it's, I would probably want that to be a little bit more specific, like Did you tell the story of Raven and the Salmon Box? Or Salmon House? So when you've got two verbs in a sentence, then how do you know when you can kind of smush them together and just make one of them possessed or relational or whatever, and when you need to do something else? That's a good question, because the other interesting thing is you have, okay, there's, there's a set of, it's not always consistent in my, it seems, when you're telling, what am I saying here, hold on, I'm trying, I'm trying to talk and create slides at the same time, okay. So one of the things we have here, one of these can be a noun, one of these can be a verb. If I say this is a noun, how would I translate it as a noun? Hunt. 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 Well, as, no, as, as a noun. The hunt, like the hunt, or hunt. I, well... <laughs> No. The thing that one does when one hunts. Hunting. Okay. That's how I think that one would be translated. As a noun. As a noun. Hunting. Mm -hmm. I enter server. That's why I said a hunt. Like you go to the store to buy hunting supplies. Yeah, or say I'm going. I'm going to go Isn't hunting. That a verb. Then? That's hunting not a verb. Yeah. yeah, it's a verb. Tell me about hunting. It's a gerund. Mm -hmm. oh. It's a it's a verbal noun. Yes, yes. We're using Shingit terms. It is in, in Shingit, this is a verbal noun. So if this if this one on the right, shinach a is a verb, how would I translate that? Well, he hunts. Has, oh, well, yes. So they are hunting or they hunt. 
So there are some verbs that do this. Here's another one. Oh, I think this one is. Is that right? Isn't there a high tone? Yeah. Okay. I get these ones mixed up. If the one on the left is a noun, how would I translate it? I'm keeping this ing, just so you all know. Uh -huh. <laughs> Dancing? So one of the things that's tricky here is the version that you're seeing in that achun dot, that is a noun. It has to be a noun, or else you can't have dots, right? Because you can't say, for example, I am watching it. Chashatin dot. It doesn't make sense. Chatlitzin dot. I don't think that makes sense. So you'd say achlitzin dot. So you have... So one of the tricks here is like the noun and the verb are exactly the same here. So you sort of get it from context. So if you wanted to say, uh, for example, because uh, what you're talking about is when you tie two verbs together, right? So we have mm -hmm. yesterday and then plus ich setin. Now that verb, that second verb changes. So what the change that that second verb makes, if I say, I didn't see you, I would say, So it ends up in this form we call the negative perfective, which would be didn't happen, didn't become that way. And then it gets a relational suffix. But that would be time, and so this I would translate on its own. That or when I saw you. That's a big question. Okay. Achun dot get Oh, Did you tell a story about hunting? I went to the store for apples. Undaka hidi de hua good hukka. Hawk. Hawk. Or books. You know. <laughs> I, I got a thing at the store. <laughs> This is what happens when I stress my memory and not my dictionary. Okay. After we get everyone's examples and look at mine, we're gonna learn. We're gonna talk about how to say a book about apples, but we'll look at that. Okay. Any other variations? So, you have, I, Nask? I would say nask, because I think you could say It gets weird if you say first. It could probably work, but I think it would sound 
strange. Like, store I went to for apples. Like, you know, it's... You can. You can. So what about a book about apples? That would be like a book apple. Maybe. What about dot cook? dot cook. dot cook. But it's interesting because it could sound like there are books around the apple, but I don't, I don't think. It, okay. Anyways, you walk towards the ocean, right? Any other options, variants? So we're kind of hearing, so the get part, right? So what I would probably say in this, um, because, and these are very similar things. But if I were to say, that the translation might be a little different very similar right but how might that translation be, be did, uh, did you walk towards the ocean did you walk yes or no ocean, right so you've got a yes or no question where it's like right so yay a que would be is is that is that how it is for me, I would say ye kushe. Um, but the difference between ye kushe and ye akwe is pretty slight. What is the difference between ye akwe and ye kushe? Um, this is just a wild guess, but is the a and akwe like the same as like, uh, is, is like the thing? So, you know, uh, it, it is the thing right versus is that right? I don't know. It wouldn't have to be, because I know it says right. Yeah. It, but when when you say that in English, you're not saying. It, it, is that how it is versus is it how it is? You know. I guess I don't know. Well, okay. So this is really interesting. I think it's a little slippery because in English you could say, uh, "You went there, right?" Right. So you're sort of you're kind of questioning your own statement. Right? Whereas you say, is that right? Which is sort of saying, is it correct? Mm -hmm. So those, those are slightly different things that are, and context means an awful lot here, right? Because like if you're having a negotiation with a teenager who's maybe got a altered reality in their story, <laughs> and you're saying, okay, you went to their house, is that right? Is that right? That's what you're telling me, right? So, but, so, <laughs> If you were to tell someone, is, is that it? Is that how it is? You went to the ocean. But if I say, is it perhaps that you went to the ocean? So that there's kind of questions of formality that are here. So like when we do these isolated sentence translations, that's why I, there's no right or wrong in any of this, right? We're learning like all these different little sort of variations in how things might change. Because we might need to ask someone, it depends on the situation. Did you eat that? Did you eat 
the cookie. Did you eat the fish? Um, and then you can say, did you maybe eat the fish? Or is it that you eat the fish? You know, so yeah, there's, there's some wiggle room. So is your cliche like more polite or more formal? It's like, it's, it's depends. It can be, okay. but it could also be like, maybe is that how it is? Um, because I might be guessing too. When I often t as, uh, talk to fluent speakers or uh, t talk to somebody who knows more than me, uh, I often like say a chunk of sentence and then I'll say, yeah, uh, quite. Is, is it better to say, yeah, quite or yeah, couche when I'm talking to someone? Yeah. Probably, yeah, quite. Um, but you could also say, well, it depends, because that's kind of, it's being, shortcutting a little bit so it depends because it depends on like if you say something like Kate has a team yeah it's not clear that you're asking them whether or not you said it correctly you're saying did I see a dog and that's a strange question right because I'm like hey, what's a unless I'm there with you right so if you say Kate has a team yeah I'd be like I'm not you, so I don't know. But you could say, a yach a kwe ye yach waka. Did I say it correctly? A yach a kwe? A yach a kwe ye yach waka. <laughs> has an interesting turn of phrase for that saying, uh, please correct me. Hmm. Kayach uh, wasai kindan. Oh. Let's take a look at that. Because if you, I would, like if I was talking to Kakha, I would probably like say that and then start saying things. Letting her know like, please correct me from now on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that she would hesitate. Is it this one? Okay, that's Kikikasa. I'm looking at Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. What is that? Is that under marks? Okay. I don't know if this existed. Oh, it's the little. It's a little booklet from the CA. It's under the deeper dive than I thought it would be. Keep going. That's a CD1. Where does it mean CD2? Okay. Yep. So this, okay. Sayach Hwasai, Kedain Khan Kananik. So I would probably recommend writing this with either a glottal right here or as two separate words. So tesh ayach can contract to shayach. So shayach would mean tesh ayach. Incorrect. Chosai. When or that I have named it incorrectly. Kedain, carefully. Khan, achim. Kananik, please tell me. So, well, I guess it's not tell. Um, when I name something in, uh, it's so hard to translate in English. Tell, carefully tell me when I have named something incorrectly. Because you could also say, Shayach. Oh, wait. So the the kedain part is really interesting because this is an adverb, and the way that some of these adverbs are made is you take a verb root and you put dain on it, smush them together. A, like yak a. And dain gets you kedain. So usually kedain means to do something well or to do it carefully. But 
it has these other kind of interesting uses because if you say kedain uh, kokati, and we gotta go back to our little slideshow here if I can find it. Okay, so. I'm just gonna copy this. So if you say Kedain Kokati, which you might have heard in the speech by Nora Downhauer about 35 minutes ago, what does what might that translate to? May it be well, maybe. So it's in along those lines, but maybe in fewer words, I guess. It will be. It will be good. I think of it as it will improve. And it's a really interesting way, because sometimes the way thing at works, it's like this is this kind of thing, this is this kind of thing. You put them together and it's a slightly different thing, right? And it's, and it's not like a huge difference between like, but like, it will be goodly, I guess, is how you would sort of work it on what's going on within the grammar. But this is a case where like, so when you say, um, khan you, there's two different ways like something like this can be interpreted. And so this is where, again, context really matters. So in this example from Johnny Marks, who was an incredible speaker of Tlingit, with that context, it's saying, tell me how to do it well. Right? But it could, but in, in, again, coming back to our wayward teenager, whose narratives are not quite lining up, and now I'm starting to get suspicious, I might say, In that context, it's like, tell it to me carefully, because you mess up this big trouble. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know if teenagers listen to me or not. OK, one more. Is there a difference in like certainty between yeakwe and yekushe? Yes. Is one like less certain or is it just kind of equivalent? Because, yes. And they come down to. So when we, when we take the question out of it, right? So if you say yeakwe, how would we translate yeakwe? That's how it is. So then if you say ye kshe, that is now a question. So kshe on its own is, I would say, perhaps, right? And just keep an eye out for this word as you just sort of read more Tlingit, hear more Tlingit, like just see how speakers are using that. And so they might use it to say, um, maybe that's, perhaps it's a boat that they are hiding behind, or perhaps it was a land otter that they saw, or perhaps it was uh, a porpoise that just jumped out of the water. So where you're taking a guess, and you're kind of, I think, a little, you're leaning a little bit more towards certainty than uncertainty. Whereas guash is saying uncertainty, like maybe, right? And But there's a little bit of doubt there, I think. And then here is there's some, I don't know, it's the opposite of doubt, I guess. Some, a little bit of certainty, but not not totally. And then shakte is right in the middle. I just can't remember how I was doing that one. Perhaps, maybe. Possibly. Possibly. Okay. 
And so we have this kind of information. Uh, oh, here's this. I'll open, I'll open the original file so you folks can see. That's probably how it is. That's possibly how it is. <clears throat> that could be how it is. I'm not sure, but is that how it is? It might be. Yeah, so like linguists, part of their work is to like come up with a bunch of different like scenarios so they can see how languages work. And so kshe kiwe shakte guash from confidence down to low confidence, <clears throat> right? And so yekshe, is that perhaps how it is? Kiwe, you see that you should, I don't see that used necessarily as question markers. Shakte, I also, it's more like, so kshe could turn into a question. Gwash could turn into a question. Kiwe and shakte are usually made as statements, but they're, like you could say, Kushtihin, uh, Kiwe, do a sock. Maybe their name was, um, Okay, these are good questions. We gotta do the last one. Okay. Ah, I'm returning from work. Jan Hagut ye jinne koch. I had some questions about that. <clears throat> I tried ye jene dach kuchyan hagut. Okay. Any other? <laughs> I had a pretty close to that last one. Ye jinadak kuk aktagu. Okay. So I have kuchte yan yan. Oops. I have kuchte yan chata guta ye jinayidak. Once I fixed it. Um, so kuch is the return part, but when it's ever in the progressive, which it is here, or the future, it switches to kuch because it hasn't made it there yet. When you have kuch or kuch in front of a motion verb, that should usually trigger it to go plus D, which is kind of an advanced thing. Like, I know high-fluency speakers who don't always do that. But then, so, I am returning. Day is always the opposite of what's before it. Dach is always short and high. A closed suffix, directional suffix in Tlingit is always short and high. Nach, dach, might be all. Okay, that's a lot. That's 20 sentences in two weeks. Why dach in What's that? Why yan? So yeah, so this letter, this is the classifier going plus D, which is an advanced concept. I don't think we've necessarily talked about that in here, but let's let's go over it um, quickly. Where am I going to find it? Hold on. I had no clue this is what your sentence was going to end up as. I, I had no clue we were starting to touch classifiers by me trying to just give you a practical sentence. 
You can't, I have the best intentions. You can't be practical and sing it without being also complicated. Mm -hmm. Just help. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think they're good senses. You know, I'm learning. I come up gives us something to look forward to. It's good. Trust me, there's some bad ones out there. Not a single one. The preview of the future. It's all good. It gives us something to explore and reach towards and ask questions about. Okay. Okay. So here's an illustration on the classifier. Uh, it's not really the one I was looking for, but it's the one that I'll show you. Okay. One important thing to remember, almost all of the modes are minus I. I actually don't call them minus I anymore. I say the classifier just had is by default. I would say the classifier is zero, sa, sha, and sha. Those are your four classifiers as they exist in their natural state. If you need to mark that the verb happened or became that way or potentially will become that way or happen, it will go plus I. So that's what the plus I thing does to say, yes, it happened. Yes, it is that way. Or potentially can be that way or can happen. It will go plus D for a number of different reasons. So one of those reasons is if the, ob the subject is also the object. So anything that's done to the self, anything that you see yourself, you, you do something for yourself, those will be plus D verbs. Other things that will trigger the plus D is returning. So there's certain types of motion things that will just, a, a return in Tlingit is usually signaled by the plus D. So you'd say good, which is this one, but you'd say, I came back. So we note those things in different ways to say this will push the classifier plus D. But it's 736, so we can't talk about it anymore. But we will, and it will be okay. Atlan Gunas Chish, Cyril George once said, a pat on the back never hurt anybody. So give yourself a pat on the back. You did excellent work with these 20 sentences. And on Thursday, you'll get 10 more. But maybe we will, I don't know, we'll see. There's some that are a little more straightforward. There's some that are trying to push you just a little bit. And so it's okay if they're not, nobody's going to go 10 for 10. I didn't go 10 for 10. I didn't go 10 for 10. Good cheese. Good cheese. Good cheese. Good Thank you.